welcome. I'm Derpy Goose. I like writing novel manuscripts and writing about linguistics. And today we are taking a dive into the human mind, or perhaps the concept of a mind. More specifically, everyone else's consciousness. When we write and when we read, we are creating and experiencing a world from a perspective that is not entirely our own. And this ability to embody a perspective that is not our own is something fundamentally human. Theory of mind. An individual's understanding that each person they encounter has their own thoughts, beliefs, emotions, intentions, and history of experiences that minds differ. I won't lie, I talk about theory of mind kind of a lot. <laughs> it doesn't seem to matter whether I'm analysing writing, or ranting about linguistics, or venting at work about customers who seem to think I can mind read. Spoiler, I can't. You're gonna need to use your words. <laughs> Theory of mind just tends to weave its way into my thinking. And it makes sense because whilst this particular concept is hardly groundbreaking, wow, we all have our own minds, who would have thought? It is something that really underpins humanity's social interactions. All right, so what are we talking about here? mind reading, knowing others can't mind read, embodying another perspective, just being a decent human being, empathy, sympathy. What is all of this about? What is theory of mind? Well, to start, let's just clarify that it's theory of mind, or even an individual's theory of mind, and not the theory of mind. Like you might talk about the theory of relativity. Theory of mind is the term used to describe an individual's understanding of how the mind works. So each individual may have a different understanding, and throughout your life, your understanding will shift and change and develop. When I was a kid, I genuinely struggled to understand how emotions could play such a large role in decision making and actions. You feel guilty? Just ignore it and make the most rational decision. What are you doing? With time, more exposure to deeper negative emotions and more exposure to social interactions and exposure to others' stories, I understand better now why that is far easier said than done, and why assuming any particular individual will make rational decisions, or even assuming I myself will always make rational decisions, is foolish. <laughs> My understanding of how the mind works is of course only a theory. I don't have direct tangible evidence that, for example, guilt can impact the decision-making process. I have a plethora of circumstantial evidence using people's actions to attempt to back-engineer what their decision-making process must have been, but the only mind I have direct access to is my own, and more and more I suspect the access I have to my own thought processes is a rather small and selective window, much more obscured off in the wings and safely tucked out of view to even me than is comfortable to think about. So, what's so special about having an understanding of what the mind is, and that each individual's mind is separate and unique? Put simply, a functional theory of mind allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes, to piece together what conclusions they will likely come to given your understanding of the information they have at hand, opinions they have previously expressed, experiences you are aware of them having gone through, and your impression of their emotional state. You are taking what information you have about this other person and using it to predict their thoughts. which. Interestingly, also makes you better at being able to predict when someone doesn't have enough information to successfully predict yours. Theory of mind isn't mind reading. It's not being able to walk past a stranger and know they are wondering, hmm, how come we domesticated wolves but didn't like domesticate bears? Wouldn't like a pet teddy bear be super cute? No. <laughs> Theory of mind is about making logical deductions given an understanding that those around us are viewing the world through a different set of information. 
different views and values and different life experiences. A common test for whether a child has begun to understand what the mind is and specifically whether they have begun to understand that different people have different knowledge access is to talk them through a simple scenario involving a person making a change unknown to the other person and asking the child whether this other person will be aware of the change. If you understand that a person's thoughts are influenced by the information they have at hand, that not everyone has the same information as you, your reply that the person without the information doesn't have the information. So an example of such a scenario could be to talk the child through one person, let's call them Emma, baking a cake and putting it in a cupboard to cool. Emma leaves the kitchen and while she is not present, her friend Morgan finds the cake, takes a slice, and puts it back in the fridge. When Emma returns to the kitchen, where is she going to look first for the, the cupboard she left it in or the fridge where it actually is? She will, of course, look first in the cupboard she left it in, where she last saw it, where, as far as the information she has, it will be. And most school aged children and older will reply with just this. Younger toddlers, however, are more likely to reply that Emma will look first in the fridge because the toddler knows that that is where the cake is. And without a theory of mind, they don't yet understand that others don't have access to the same information they have. They know it's in the fridge. They have been told Emma is looking for it. She will look for it where it is, the fridge. Theory of mind continues to develop throughout childhood with a well-developed theory of mind going beyond just understanding what information your audience has, but also taking into account previously expressed opinions, their emotional state, prior experiences you are aware of, and in general, the broad range of information available to you to predict how another will likely respond to a particular communication, perhaps even manipulate the communication to yield the emotional reaction you want. Manipulating someone, that requires a good understanding of how that other person's mind works. What will sway them? Most teenagers and adults will have a functioning theory of mind without needing any formal instruction. There are, however, a number of factors believed to impact this, including a child having limited exposure to language, as well as various neurodivergencies. There has also been research around how to best identify and provide early intervention for at-risk children. All very interesting topics of research. However, I don't really want to get into these topics in a 15 minute video about how being considerate of how individual brains differ helps with writing. There's just a lot of nuance and any overarching statements will either just be flat out wrong or hedge to a point of meaninglessness. But even when everyone in the room theoretically understands, no one can mind read. I've still found being aware of a theory of mind and aware that it isn't always applied helpful. Prior to learning about theory of mind and realizing that it's not always applied, if I was asked to do something and given very little information, I would assume that what I was given was all I needed. Why would my boss withhold needed information? And therefore I must be being dumb or stupid or not up to the task. Having experienced this exact situation more times than I can count, however, and having gotten more confident in pushing back and asking for clarification, I can say without a doubt that the vast majority of times I've felt I don't have enough information to do a task is because I don't have enough information to do that task. And the response I've gotten to clarifying questions has more often than not just been a quick, oh, sorry, yes, of course you need to know that, followed by the information, or at least a pathway to get the information. What about writing, however? That's what we're here to talk about after all. Storytelling and communication in all its various and wondrous forms. And when it comes to storytelling and theory of mind, there is obvious applications. Storytelling is all about providing an audience sufficient information to understand. I've worked as a beta reader for countless young authors. It's a task I absolutely love, but one thing that often occurs in earlier drafts, 
especially in scenes you can tell the writer was really excited about. Because again, getting super caught up in your own excitement can make it harder to think about things from others' perspectives. And I often see in these scenes passages that are confusing, that require large leaps of logic from the reader, or that simply draw on prior information the reader doesn't have. I'm a big believer in early drafts are going to be riddled with issues that you will fix in the later drafts. So it's no issue at all and no reflection against the writer, but it is perhaps something to keep in mind when working through your later drafts, catching all those bits where maybe you haven't thought from the reader's perspective quite as clearly as you need to. And beta readers or critique partners are a great way to catch this stuff because they will tell you if it's not making sense. Ensuring you're providing enough information is just the first layer, however. And here, storytelling poses an interesting complication because as a writer, you are blind to your audience. You might have a rough idea of the age group, the majority of your readers will fall into. You'll likely have a few clues as to their interests and the genres they like, but you don't know them as individuals. They are like the audience in a darkened theater. You know whoever showed up must have had a reason to, and based on your marketing, that might give you a few clues. But you can't see them. You can't even distinguish between audience member and an empty chair. You have no idea of their previous experiences, of their beliefs, what mood they are in. You are trying to manipulate the mind of a complete un. No, it's something I found really helpful and which was not a natural realization for me is understanding not just that we all have different thoughts, but that we think differently. If your work is highly visual, then this will appeal strongly to someone who has a strong ability to visualize. An individual who sees scenes in their mind is likely to find this the easiest way of being immersed in your story and may find it frustrating or difficult if visual information they view as crucial to conjuring a scene in their mind is missing, such as the hair color of the protagonist. If they view each scene from a third person camera angle like it's a movie and they don't know what color to imagine the protagonist's hair, immersion broken. I don't visualize scenes like this when I read. I don't find limited or even absent character descriptions frustrating. I don't even really notice if they're not there. When a movie of a book comes out, I've never really understood the she looks different to what I saw comments because I never saw the character as anything other than a blobby outline that moved. Stories with unclear descriptions of how characters are moving in a fight scene, however, and I'm gonna struggle to be viewing that in my mind. Suddenly the blobs are just sort of moving around aimlessly tapping swords because you're not giving me the description I need. And it's just not jalling with the supposed urgency of the scene. But I can't work out the descriptions and so my immersion is broken. I'm reminded that I'm reading. The information that is relevant to an individual imagining your story differs. By all means, tell me how something smells, but it's more just a mental boosted note than me actually perceiving the smell in my mind because I didn't realize people could smell in their mind until a friend looked at me weird for suggesting that I couldn't. It makes less sense to me than seeing. I can at least create outlines. So I imagine when you visualize, it's just like more detailed, but smell? How do you smell in your head? When I first started writing manuscripts, I was against giving visual descriptions because it was boring and meaningless. I wrote stories that were perfect for how I thought and as poorly written as many other aspects were, even today I can recognize that the way I described scenes has almost a tangibleness that I rarely experience when reading. But that wasn't because I was brilliant at describing scenes, it was because I was describing them for me, someone who doesn't focus on shapes and movement and layouts as much as I do would find the information they do need all but entirely absent and would be able to make limited meaning out of the detailed descriptions of where people were standing in relation to one another. Understanding that every member of your audience brings their own knowledge set, their own experience, their own emotional biases, and their own way of thinking and imagining is 
crucial for writing stories that can be engaged with by whoever your audience may be. All right. In any case, that's it from me. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and see you again soon.